Okay guys, let's get started. So over the weekend, we asked you to try to explain Bitcoin to one of your family members or friends. Uh, I hope you all did that. Yeah. Uh, and I also hope you guys ran into some questions that you couldn't answer. Uh, because I was, I was thinking about why we do this history lecture, and it reminded me of the first time I tried to explain Bitcoin to somebody. And the question that he asked me was, well, why don't you just use Venmo? Because uh, to him, it sounded like the same thing, except like Nadir mentioned before, while Bitcoin is decentralized, it's also slow and redundant and expensive to run. So the question is, like, why would anybody want to use Bitcoin, much less spend time developing it? And so today we're going to go through the motivations and the ideologies of the people who developed Bitcoin. And uh, while we spend most of our time talking about how Bitcoin works, today's lecture is about why Bitcoin is the way it is. So we're going to tell you this story of how we got from the cypherpunks, who hated big banks and created cryptocurrencies because of it, to JP Morgan Chase. And we're going to start off with these libertarian dreams. I'm going to talk about two groups, the cypherpunks and the crypto anarchists. So they were very libertarian groups, um, and they were also cryptography advocates. So they were very concerned with privacy, and they hated the idea of like the NSA being able to spy on them, uh, the army having the most advanced cryptography technology and being able to use that to invade people's privacy. They hated censorship. And most of all, big banks and other institutions that represented really centralized power. And so among other things, they felt the need for a anonymous financial system. So cash is, is pretty anonymous. Um, once you've spent it, it's hard to trace it back to you and it's hard to know where you got it from. Um, but in this digital era or this open society as they called it, um, it's, it's harder to become anonymous. And so they saw cryptography as a very important tool that would enable them to stay private or be able to selectively reveal themselves to the world. And so they wanted a cryptocurrency, but it's important to understand that they didn't just decide they wanted Bitcoin and create it right off the bat. And so there were a lot of attempts at cryptocurrencies, but these two, I would say, are the most important ones or major ones. So the first is Digicash, which was developed by this very smart OG crypto wizard named David Chaum. And he implemented the idea of blind signatures or using public and private key cryptography, which allowed you to reveal absolutely nothing about your identity, but still be able to consistently sign off on transactions and authenticate that uh, things were coming from you. But the problem with Digicash was that it was his own company that he was running. And so it was centralized. And if this company went down, then the currency went down with it. And that's what happened. And it wasn't a reliable currency. And so they decided that they wanted decentralization. But the problem with this is currencies need to be trustworthy and scarce, among other things. And so the natural solution to this is to have a central bank or government issue people coins or issue people currency and assure those users that, hey, this dollar has value, a, a set amount of value, and it will still have this amount of value in the future. So Hashcash was another cryptocurrency that used cryptographic hash functions and a puzzle to solve this problem. So it was decentralized, and they said, okay, coins can be minted, but you have to expend resources, um, and time has to pass by for you to be able to do this. Does this remind you of anything? Yeah, proof of work. And so these ideas were definitely implemented in Bitcoin. So later in 2008, October, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, this guy went, or, or girl, um, he's anonymous, so we don't know if this person is multiple people, what the gender is, whatever, um, but I'm just going to say he um, for, the, for the name. And so he released this white paper called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And in it, he addressed the need for, for trust. And he identified that as the problem of why you need, uh, why you can't easily implement decentralization. And so he solved this problem using proof of work as the distributed uh, consensus mechanism. And he said, okay, so this 
can guarantee us that we have one CPU, one vote. And along with this, he included a lot of like similar language to the cypherpunks that showed that he basically was contributing to this many years of libertarians trying to develop crypt uh, cryptocurrencies. And so he put all these ideas together and he talked about the incentives as to why people would mine and why Bitcoin would work. And nobody really cared about his white paper. In fact, he had a lot of critics uh, who were dismissive of his paper, but he had a few supporters, such as Hal Finney, and so they started developing on it. And two months later, on January 3rd, the Genesis block of, of Bitcoin was mined. Or, yeah. Um, and in that block, they actually reference a story in the London newspaper involving the chancellor bailing out banks. And this was a really big uh, controversial event that pissed off a lot of libertarians and contributed to their, um, their want of a cryptocurrency that was decentralized because it was like the show of like abuse of power and taking po and they wanted to uh, give power to the individuals and that's why Bitcoin exists. And so this uh, reference in the first block is kind of like a wink to Bitcoin's libertarian roots. And so as more people start joining the Bitcoin network and mining, uh, I'll, it still doesn't have any value. It's still mostly like CS nerds and cypherpunks who make up the Bitcoin network. And this guy named Laszlo Hanez, uh, he plays video games and he realizes that the processing chip in his computer is not only good at processing video games, but also really good at solving the mining puzzle. And so for a while, he starts uh, mining very, very easily because the network was not very competitive at that time. And he's getting like a fifth of the Bitcoins every day, so like thousands of Bitcoins. So he's sitting on this pile of Bitcoins, and he and Satoshi uh, realize that it doesn't really do the network very good if one person is dominating the mining, uh, has all the hash power. But Lazo is very interested in seeing Bitcoin succeed. And so he posts on a forum and he says, I will pay 10,000 Bitcoin to someone who buys me a pizza. And at this, at, today we see this as $46 million. Uh, actually, uh, I made this slide a few days ago and it's actually, I think, $41 million right now. Um, but fun fact, last semester when Sunny taught this lecture, it was $9 million. And the year, uh, the semester before that, when Andrew taught this lecture, it was six million dollars. Uh, so the Bitcoin prices change pretty frequently. Um, but today, it's it's very easy to look at this this piece of news and say like, oh, poor guy, like he must have not known that Bitcoin was going to have value, and he accidentally gave away like forty five million dollars. But uh, quite the contrary, right? Uh, Lazo believed that Bitcoin would have value one day, and he created the world's first ever Bitcoin transaction that um, exchanged Bitcoin, which was worthless, worthless magic internet money, for something of real value. And so he knew that the Bitcoin ecosystem needed to be built up somehow, that it had to have value by distributing the coins. And so he's a real hero to Bitcoin because he's the one who brought value to it or did the first transaction that brought it value. And so Bitcoin starts to gain popularity. Um, people start wanting to join the network and have their own coins so they can, can transact with it. Um, but it obviously attracts positive and negative attention. Uh, at this time, though, it was hard to get Bitcoins. You could only do it by mining, which was getting more and more competitive, or if somebody gave you the Bitcoins. And so some exchanges started popping up, uh, most notably Mt. Gox, which was started in 2010 by Jed McCaleb, and it became the the biggest Bitcoin ex online exchange. It was handling about 70% of all Bitcoin transactions at some point in 2014. But uh, if you take a look at this meme that I made, um, remember when Nadir mentioned last week that all of your Bitcoins are tied to your private key, right? That's how you send uh, transactions and own that Bitcoin. And so obviously if you lose your private key, you lose all your Bitcoin. And that is a problem 
um, because it's a disadvantage in the Bitcoin system, right? Its security kind of relies on people's private keys being secure. And the problem with exchanges like Mt. Gox is that you're introducing a, a point of centralization, which is also a central point of failure, right? So if it's handling 70% 70, 70 of all transactions, um, it's handling a lot of private keys. And so, it's, <laughs> and so if somebody hacks into Mt. Gox, or if an administrator is doing you know, bad practices within Mt. Gox, uh, you could lose all the money that, that Mt. Gox holds. And that's exactly what happened. In 2014, Mt. Gox realized that they lost more than 700,000 bitcoins. Um, they just disappeared under their noses and they had to declare a bankruptcy. And this was a huge scandal. Um, it was all over the news. Bitcoin, the prices tanked um, and people were calling it a Bitcoin hack. But of course, Bitcoin itself wasn't hacked. It was Mt. Gox that, was, that uh, had problems. And another event I want to talk about is uh, Silk Road. So in 2011, this guy called Ross Ulbrich is cooking shrooms in, in, his, apart in his house. And he wants to open a anonymous eBay of drugs where you could buy, you know, all these illegal goodies. Um, and, and so he used Tor to allow people to anonymously browse this um, anonymous market and used Bitcoin f to accept the payments. So, uh, so everything would remain anonymous. And so this made Bitcoin more popular. Um, it became like the killer use case for Bitcoin, for Bitcoin. And while it did increase the popularity and the volume of transactions in Bitcoin and drive up the price, uh, it also um, brought it, it made Bitcoin very strongly associated with drugs and illegal activities. Like this was around the time when I first heard about Bitcoin and you know all I knew was, oh, that's where you buy drugs. But in October 2013, the FBI shut down Silk Road and arrested Ross Ulbrich. He's now in jail serving a life sentence without possibility of parole. And they also seized a lot of Bitcoin. And this was another scandal that definitely made Bitcoin take a few hits and also put it up in the news. Uh, this is a graph from November 2013. So this is all one month. But if you notice, the lowest price here is 200 and the highest is more than a thousand so in less than a month Bitcoin prices shot from 200 to a thousand and there's a lot of theories as to why this happened um, Bitcoin is in the news a lot and very hyped up at, around this point um, and around this time we also saw like an explosion of altcoins so alternative Bitcoin. So they took the Bitcoin source code and they improved it or kept it the same and created another cryptocurrency out of it because it was so successful. Um, so a few notable ones, uh, Zcash and Dash both try to um, increase customer or the user's privacy um, through zero knowledge proofs or other protocols. We'll go into that in a later lecture. Uh, PureCoin was the first cryptocurrency to use proof of stake, which is an alternative consensus mechanism that doesn't use up a lot of resources like proof of work does. And Dogecoin, one of my favorites, um, it was, I think, considered a joke coin, but they did a lot of charity work and it was a cool community to be a part of. And it's still here today. I want to take you through some of the Bitcoin headlines in 2014 when it was at the height of its popularity. So of course Mt. Gox lost $350 million in Bitcoin. That was a huge headline at the time. And around this time people started to realize that they didn't actually know who Satoshi Nakamoto was. And so they started hunting for him. And they found people with that actual name in phone books and uh, they unfortunately were probably harassed. Um, and people started speculating about Bitcoin's price, that it was headed for 10000 And we're actually kind of close to that now, so maybe it'll happen. And around this time, uh, legal merchants start accepting uh, Bitcoin as well. Uh, PayPal, Microsoft, Overstock, um, and porn, and marijuana, and uh, this very interesting service called Shit Express that allows you to pick pick an animal and it will mail a cup Tupperware container of that animal's 
manure with a personalized message on your behalf, and you can use Bitcoin to stay anonymous. Around this time, we also see a lot of Bitcoin startups arising. Uh, how many of you here use Coinbase? Yeah, cool. So Coinbase is a online wallet management and exchange service. Um, so you can you could buy Bitcoin with it and use your credit card and stuff uh, to to pay. And now it also supports Ether and Litecoin. And it was one of the most successful early Bitcoin startups. Um, and Anderson Horowitz, or A16Z, did a lot of investment in the tech industry at this point. And they were very influential in bolstering the Bitcoin slash cryptocurrency field at this point. Um, they poured a lot of money and definitely helped it succeed. As well as some other companies as well. And so this is a graph from 2014 to 2015 where uh, Bitcoin prices, as you can see in the beginning, they shot up and then they slowly started to fall a little bit. Of course, they ended up going back up, but uh, this was kind of scary to a lot of people in the Bitcoin community. And there's a few theories as to why this happened. A lot of people like to blame the Chinese investors for uh, speculating about Bitcoin a lot and just pouring a lot of money, driving it all the way up to more than $1,000. And then the Chinese government came in and said, oh, we're going to regulate cryptocurrencies. Uh, we don't like this. And so they dumped everything and the price just tanked. Um, some other theories include uh, Mt. Gox bots buying up, like Willybot, buying up Bitcoin con continuously and driving up the price. Um, you'll read about that in this week's readings. And so we're kind of reaching the end of our Bitcoin related history. Um, but one last thing that I want to talk about is scalability. So in 2015, um, the blocks begin to fill up because I think we mentioned this in the last, le in the last lecture, but Bitcoin blocks are created every 10 minutes and can only hold one megabyte of transactions. So the very limited amount of transactions that you can have every 10 minutes. And so what happened was blocks started running out of space. A lot of transactions would kind of just float around and not be confirmed or ever added to the blockchain. And so it started becoming very slow. And a lot of people started saying like, why don't we just increase the block size? And so there's, there's a few arguments on either side. So you want to keep it small so that you can prevent certain attacks. And so that uh, the size of the blockchain grows a bit slower. But obviously we wanted things to scale. Um, so they wanted to increase the block size. And so that was a block size debate. But what really was important about this was it raises questions about decentralized governance. So we have this really nice consensus protocol that allows us to all agree on the network about the transactions that happen. But what about like software and how Bitcoin works in general, right? You can't really force everyone on the network. There's no centralized authority to tell everyone, oh, there's a software upgrade, do it now. Um, because some people might not agree with the block size being increased, and that would cause the Bitcoin network to fork. And now Aparna is going to talk to you guys about Ethereum. So, so far we've been talking about Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is coin-centric. Its primary purpose is to be an alternative to existing currencies. So it's a great store of value and a great medium for transactions, but not much else. That's where we start talking about Ethereum. Ethereum is a Turing complete protocol that uses its coin Ether as fuel. It comes with this flavor of smart contracts on top of what Bitcoin already offers. So its primary purpose is to be a platform for decentralized applications, also called as smart contracts. So let's take a look at the history of Ethereum. So back in 2013, think of this scrawny looking guy called Vitalik, who's 19 years old, he's a university dropout, but he's super involved in the Bitcoin space, he's on all the forums, he understands the technology really well. He starts Bitcoin Magazine, um, and he has this idea to add what's called smart contracts, or decentralized applications, onto Bitcoin. But he doesn't get a lot of support from the Bitcoin community, 
So he decides, you know, fuck that, I'm going to start my own cryptocurrency and call it Ethereum. And that he describes in the white paper, which he posts on Reddit. This is sometime in late 2013. Um, starting 2014, he tries to gather a team of people to help him build this out and flesh out the details. Sometime around April, they have their yellow paper, which is basically the technical or mathy paper. White paper is supposed to be the non-technical one. Um, they publish their yellow paper, and they have a team ready, all set to develop. What do they need? Funds. So, sometime in July and August, they have their crowd sale and raise $18 million to fund their development. And a, almost a year later, they have the Ethereum blockchain launch. This is a huge deal because it's the first public blockchain that can support decentralized applications. Um, within just a year, it's value skyrockets to more than a billion dollars and this is a huge stepping stone because Ethereum is now the second cryptocurrency apart from Bitcoin to reach this value. Around This is the first way in which Ethereum blew up in 2016. Around the same time, this idea of DAO or decentralized autonomous organizations start coming up. What are these? DAOs are basically just organizations which are run by pieces of code or smart contracts on the blockchain. And investors in DAO, or people who hold DAO tokens, are allowed to vote on different proposals on how to spend the money collected in the DAO. The DAO, which is an example of a DAO, is actually a German-developed smart contract that was that came out sometime in 2016, but unfortunately for them, oh, important note, they raised $150 million back in 2016, the largest ever crowd sale in history up until that point. So, of course, hackers are looking into it. What happens? Well, they find a little vulnerability in the smart contract code, and boom. 10% of the then existing Ether market cap is stolen. That is a huge deal. And to kind of resolve this, there are different solutions that are proposed. Um, the Ethereum Foundation, which runs Ether, proposes a rollback. Basically what that means is, oh, let's go back to a point in time where this hack didn't happen, and let's all pretend everything's okay. Um, Another group of people who are super idealistic and libertarian and don't like the idea of like a non-immutable blockchain say no, like that, that can't happen. So the Ethereum community splits and the blockchain forks or splits into two. One on which the DAO hack did happen and another on which it hasn't happened. So, after resolving that, Many of you have probably heard of Ethereum prices just skyrocketing. Here are some possible reasons as to why. Um, so, the ruling of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission on the Dow fiasco was supposed to come out sometime between March and May this year. So there was a lot of speculation regarding that. Um, that's one possible reason. Other economic circumstances were the Winklevoss brothers tried to create an exchange-traded fund for Bitcoin. What that means is if it passed, Bitcoin could be traded like anything else on, uh, on your general trading platform. Um, however, speculation around that led to Ether prices rising. Rising, So people were anticipating it not to pass for Bitcoin, so Ether becoming the more powerful currency. Lots of things around that. And then you also had what was called ICOs, pump and dump of money, happening, which we'll talk about in a future slide. Um, this was also a great year for crypto and blockchain-based companies to get a lot of venture capital funding. Um, other factors could be sometime around March as the price 
the price then is like $10, the news starts becoming mainstream, and everyone's like, oh, I hear of Ether, its price is $10, could it be the next Bitcoin? Oh, maybe this is the right time to get in on the turn, you know? I don't want to miss out on what could be the next Bitcoin. So as everyone starts hearing about it, everyone puts their money in it, and of course, it goes from $10 to $420. And naturally, as the Ethereum price rises, so does the Bitcoin price. Because all the cryptocurrencies are in some way linked to each other. As some news becomes mainstream about Ethereum, people start hearing about Bitcoin as well, and the price goes up. Other reasons why the Bitcoin price could have skyrocketed could be people trying to circumvent capital controls, um, and a general instability in the market. Um, but why was there instability? That's because there was a lot of uncertainty that arose from Brexit, which happened, if you all recall. Trump coming into power, um, India trying to demonetize its currency. And what happens in times of uncertainty? People turn to gold. And what's digital gold? Bitcoin. So... That's probably another reason why Bitcoin price went up. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about public blockchains like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum so far. Let's talk about interest in private companies in the blockchain. And particularly, banks. So, banks have been around for a while and they start hearing of blockchain back sometime in 2013 if you remember the huge price soar and then the price crash so the news starts becoming mainstream and the banks are like oh okay they start taking note of bitcoin um and they like what bitcoin offers but they don't want it to be open they don't want a community of people mining nor do they want people to stop trusting themselves like banks are coins of trust and banks in no way want the U.S. dollar to be replaced, right? So they start creating this distinction of blockchain from Bitcoin. But up until then, people only knew of the blockchain, which was the Bitcoin blockchain. But banks start coming out with this idea of private blockchains or permission ledgers and create this distinction. So here are some of the other private initiatives that came up around this time. Some of the most notable ones are R2CV, which is a consortium. So it's somewhere in between a public blockchain and a private blockchain. R2CV was a group of like 50 banks pulling in all their money into doing blockchain research that would be good for all of them. However, think of all these big 50 power players who can't come to a decision, so they all start falling apart and start funding their own research. Um, like JP Morgan. Back, I think in 2013 or 2014, they started having a Juno project, which failed. And now they have a project called Quorum, which tries to um, add this layer of privacy to transactions, but in a private financial setting. Question so far? Yes. Oh, um, we'll talk about that in a future lecture. Any other questions? Okay. And many of you might have heard of IBM and the Hyperledger Fabric Project. Yes? Okay. So, the next few slides depict the attitude change from banks and other large financial institutions. Um, as we see the quotes of Jamie Dimon, who is the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, you can see the change in his attitude and how that sort of translates into what all these banks feel. So, Jan 2014, he says about Bitcoin, it's a terrible store of value 
it could be replicated over and over again. At this point, he doesn't understand much of the technology and is just very dismissive of it. Um, October 2014, the same diamond says, Bitcoin developers are going to try and eat our lunch. And that's fine. That's called competition and we'll be competing. This, this quote kind of gives some legitimacy to Bitcoin. He starts to see that maybe it could be something that is powerful, but he doesn't know yet. And then a month later, virtual currency where it's called a Bitcoin versus a US dollar, that's going to be stopped. No government will ever support a virtual currency that goes around borders and doesn't have the same controls. It's not going to happen. Threaten Butch, he doesn't like the idea that Bitcoin could possibly take the place of banks or maybe even replace the US dollar. And bankers hate the lack of control. And come February 2016, he says, the blockchain is a technology which we've been studying, and yes, it's real. It could probably reduce the cost of real application in certain things. If it proves to be cheap and secure, it will be adopted for a whole bunch of stuff. If you note, he's making the clear distinction between blockchain and Bitcoin. An important note to be made here is banks did not want to associate with Bitcoin. Why? Well, Bitcoin, what do you think? When I say Bitcoin first, drugs, illegal activity, um, scams, right? And banks don't want their branding to be showing any kind of support to that. That's where the whole distinction comes from. And now, this is where it all started, if you recall. David Chom and DigiCash, the cypherpunks who wanted a technology that would remove a central point of control and distribute that control across people. And this is where we've ended. Banks like JP Morgan Chase using the blockchain technology that was supposed to, in a sense, overthrow them. But they are the ones putting in a lot of money into research for them. Ironic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> what did he say about blockchain though? That's okay. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Like uh, they don't want to associate with Bitcoin, but they want to associate with blockchain. So that's the interesting part. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the community and politics surrounding Bitcoin. Where does this community exist? Well, back in the Bitcoin days, most of it was on forums like Bitcoin Talk or the Bitcoin Reddit. That's actually a really cute picture that's been on the Bitcoin Reddit for like ever. Magic internet money. Um, and it's probably bought by one of the early day... Um, it, yeah. And it's still on there. They're probably like funding it to keep it up there. Um, but today, a lot of the community exists on Slack. Um, any new companies that come up, you can join their Slack, ask them questions about it. Um, a lot of discussion happens. Twitter is another important place. All the key players in Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the key professors are all tweeting at each other. This is just like a everyday spat that happens between Vitalik, if you remember, who is the developer behind Ethereum, and Peter Todd, who is another key developer for Bitcoin. And of course, blockchain at Berkeley, where else would it be? We organize a lot of meetups, a lot of deep dives, white paper circles, and conferences. Speaking of which, we have our Crypto Economics and Security Conference on October 2nd and 3rd. If you haven't got your tickets yet, go get them now. Yes? How much are they now for blockchain? I think if you volunteer, it's free. 
if you can. Yeah. Oh, okay. How, how much? How many hours? Um. Four. I'm. Yeah. Four hours. Are you walking? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So if you want more information, check out the website cese.io. Um, if you want to get more involved with the community, if you want to meet people like Vitalik, you should be attending this conference. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the politics. Um, so most of the core Bitcoin community people tend to be super libertarian. Um, a lot of politics happens between the merchants and the miners. The miners are constantly fighting for higher transaction fees and merchants for lower transaction fees. And then there's also politics regarding the scalability debate, which Gloria mentioned earlier. And if you recall, the Ethereum split. So oftentimes people's political views influences the outcome of a lot of these happenings. Okay, so now let's talk about 2017, the year of ICOs. How many of you have hear, here have heard of ICOs? How many of you have invested in any? Okay, interesting. Okay, so ICOs, what are they? ICOs are basically initial coin offerings. Think of them as um, initial public offerings without the P um, and without all the security stuff. Um, so for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically a way for people to trade their Ether for the token of a company that exists or is going to be built on top of the Ethereum blockchain. Um, something you want to note is ICOs are very different from equity. Like, they don't give you ownership of the company. Rather, you become a person who can use the product that could be built. Um, and by investing in ICO, it shows that you speculate that the, the product is going to be widely used. Um, another interesting aspect of ICOs is that they're a permissionless and easy way for everyone to invest in what they think is going to be a good company. So everyone, when I say, is from your gardener to the person who drives your Uber, they all have a free point of entry to invest in whatever they want. Some prominent ICOs that happened this year are the Bancor, Tezos, and Filecoin ICO. I think the Filecoin would now be the largest crowd sale in history, raising $253 million, which is... A lot. Think back to the time of Ethereum and the $18 million they raised. Um, one thing I would say if you plan to invest in ICOs is a lot of these products are not built. A lot of these people who promise you products don't have a proven track record. Please do your research on them before you just invest. And third and most important, there is no regulation at all on ICOs, which is what permissionless means. Which could also mean if the company that you invest in decides to burn the money in front of you, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the people who technically own the code are those who wrote the smart contract, right? Um, just because you buy some of these tokens doesn't mean you somehow own this product that the company is going to build. Rather, if you now own the token, you can use that to buy the product that the company will sell you. Does that make more sense? And without the token which the company gives you, you can't use the product. That's the whole point of why they create an ICO. It's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I have... Actually, no, I don't. I'll include a link on ICOs if anyone wants to read on that. But, that's... Oh, yeah. In terms of valuing these uh, ICOs, is it going from Ether in the time of the initial 
initial offering, like two dollars, and then that to how much how much ether is invested in these companies? Uh, how do you determine the dollar value? Like, oh. do you have to go from dollar to ether to like how much of that was given to these companies? Yeah, pretty much. Like, okay. if I invested a certain amount of ether, and then what's that ether rate today? You just convert and you okay. get it. Yeah. Can you trade the tokens on the initial SEO? Um, what do you mean trade the tokens? You mean you trade the tokens to another person? Yeah, of course. If, if you are convinced there's going to be another person who wants to buy it, that's the reason you're investing in it. Yeah. So my view is that you can't trade the tokens on the network. You can't what? You can't trade the tokens on the Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they're not like you, Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's true. Is there anything you cannot do? Is there anything, anything in the whole live world that you cannot do? That who cannot do? Uh, people who are in the ICO. Um, as of now, no. They put up the ICO, get, get out a bunch of million dollars, and go spend it. Yeah, on, because there's no regulation. Go spend it on child trafficking. Yeah, there's no regulation right now. Could you go spend it on, uh, could you go spend it on, uh, charging for some, for some, sort of, for some, or who was that, the, the, the CEO of Mega Uploads is matching, what if they spend like a bunch of million dollars on ICO on it, so on a home improvement for his mansion? Okay, I didn't know about that, but yeah. yeah. They they can basically do whatever they want right now because as I said there's they no get, they get some money from Germany.